on World News Tonight. Devastating floods. Death toll from the floods rose as a result of heavy monsoon rains in India along with thousands more displaced. Mass massacre. The small town Ubaldi is in shock as US President doubled down the demands for tighter gun laws. Not for profit. Pfizer's medicines and vaccines are now to be sold at cost for the poorer nations. And it's clown day. Lima streets filled with colour and cheer as Peruvian clowns paraded away. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight and tonight's broadcast. We begin with neighboring India as flash floods and landslides in India's northeast Assam state killed at least 25 people and displaced over 650,000 from their homes in the past 10 days. Heavy monsoons are a yearly occurrence in Assam, resulting in flooding and landslides which force residents to flee their homes, often leaving behind their belongings. The Brahmaputra River, one of the largest rivers in the world which flowed from Tibet to India and finally into Bangladesh, bursts into banks in Assam, inundating more than 1,800 villages in 26 districts this month. Parts of the railway network were also destroyed. Authorities have also set up 366 relief camps across 20 districts, providing temporary shelter for more than 95,000 people. Roads, homes and buildings have been inundated by floodwaters in parts of the state. Fighting between Russian and Ukrainian forces has reached the limits of the key eastern Ukraine city of Severodonetsk. The regional governors said describing the combat as very difficult. There is no respite in the Donbass, where Russia is stepping up its offensive and targeting Ukrainian positions. After Mariupol, the Russian army is now focused on Severodonetsk, a city in the region of Luhansk. It's been under fire day and night. Some neighborhoods are beyond recognition. Food shortages, no electricity. The majority of its 100,000 strong population has fled, but thousands remain in the city. And while some are bent on staying, others are desperately trying to get out. Now it seems like the front is all around the city. It's practically surrounded. There are tanks. There are like the, you, we can see uh, uh, trucks from the army being being deployed around the city. So it seems very clear that to me, uh, it's about to fall. The Ukrainians say that the Russian army is trying to repeat the experience of Mariupol. Severodonetsk is one of the remaining Ukrainian pockets in the Luhansk region. It's surrounded by towns already under Russian control. Severodonetsk is the easternmost city that's still under Ukrainian control. As the conflict enters its fourth month, there are no signs that Russia will let up anytime soon. Russia's defense minister repeated on Tuesday that Moscow would press on with its war until all goals are achieved. The yachts and lavish houses of Russian oligarchs that have been seized under EU sanctions could be confiscated to finance Ukraine's post-war reconstruction. The European Commission has proposed a new plan set to raise a plethora of legal questions. So far, the EU has frozen access to yachts, funds and houses of Russian oligarchs related to the war in Ukraine. Now it wants to permanently confiscate and sell them to pay for the reconstruction of the country. The European Commission has announced plans to make it lawful for member states to do so. Europe is spending billions of euros supporting Ukraine and will spend several billion in the future on the reconstruction of Ukraine. Some member states say those responsible should pay for it. The proposals mean new laws allowing for permanent confiscation will have to be introduced into each member state to facilitate judicial procedures to go after the assets. If there is a confiscation with a judicial uh, procedure, it will be possible for the member states to put the result of the confiscation, so a total amount of money, in a common fund for the Ukrainian victims and maybe to take part in the, the first steps in the rebuilding of uh, Ukraine. But of course, to do that, you need to have a transfer of 
ownership from uh, the freezing to the confiscation with a judicial decision, it will be possible uh, to organize that. While some EU countries, especially the Baltics and Poland, have been calling for this measure, it may be difficult to implement in all 27 member states. It's legally complicated. All EU countries have to agree unanimously to the proposal. It's not clear that the political will for this measure exists. So far, 10 billion euros have been frozen in physical assets and more than 20 billion euros in bank accounts by the European Union. The UK Prime Minister's office released a new report on the results of an internal investigation into lockdown parties. And with that, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson took responsibility for drinking at the party at Downing Street during the COVID-19 lockdown. Boris Johnson said he was humbled and took full responsibility. After a damning official report on Wednesday detailed illegal alcohol fueled parties at his Downing Street office during coronavirus lockdowns. The British Prime Minister has faced repeated calls to resign from opposition politicians and some in his own party. After it was revealed, Johnson and his officials broke rules against socialising outside the household. Meanwhile, many ordinary people missed the funerals of loved ones. And I also want to say, Mr Speaker, above all, that I take full responsibility for everything that took place on my watch. Sue Gray's report has emphasised that it is up to the political leadership in number 10 to take ultimate responsibility, and of course I do. The report by senior official Sue Gray did not specifically blame Johnson, but gave graphic details and included photographs from more than a dozen gatherings, some of which he attended. Johnson was among those fined over a party to celebrate his 56th birthday on June 19, 2020 though Gray said he was unaware of the gathering in advance. At a leaving party in June 2020, a scuffle broke out, one attendee was sick, and excessive amounts of alcohol were consumed, the report found. Johnson said he was appalled by some of the behaviour it had uncovered. Opposition Labour Party leader Keir Starmer said the report would stand as a monument to, quote, the hubris and arrogance of Johnson's government. Desperation turned into heart-wrenching sorrow for families of grade schoolers killed. Harrowing details have emerged about the gunman who murdered 19 children and two teachers at an elementary school in Texas. Uvalde, Texas. Now another pin on America's map of preventable tragedies. 24 hours have passed since the U.S.'s second deadliest school shooting, and investigators are trying to piece together what drove an 18-year-old high school dropout to go on a rampage at an elementary school. As of this time, the only information that was known in advance was posted by the government on Facebook approximately 30 minutes before reaching the school. The first post was, I'm going to shoot my grandmother. The second post was, I shot my grandmother. The third post, maybe less than 15 minutes before arriving at the school, was, I'm going to shoot an elementary school. The shooter is believed to have spent 40 minutes inside a fourth grade classroom before he was engaged by police. In that time frame, he used 223 rounds. In the town of Uvalde, immeasurable grief and sorrow as residents struggled to comprehend the horror that struck their community now mourning children who were just two days away from celebrating one of childhood's most blissful moments, the beginning of summer vacation. In Washington, U.S. President Joe Biden said he would be traveling to Texas in the next few days. And once again, he urged lawmakers to act on gun control, reminding them that the Second Amendment was never meant to be absolute. The Uvalde massacre is the 27th school shooting to take place in the United States this year. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, some relief for the millions of families that have been searching for baby formula, as Abbott says that their plant will start producing formula again on the 4th of June. Three manufacturing executives were questioned on the Capitol Hill by the House Oversight Committee over contamination concerns. 
Anger over the formula shortage crisis and recall erupting once again on Capitol Hill today. You owe an apology to the parents of children who got sick and possibly a couple that have died. The House Oversight Committee calling executives from three major formula manufacturers to face the public, including Abbott. Their Michigan plant was closed in February and Abbott issued a voluntary recall over contamination concerns after four babies got sick, including two who died. We are deeply, deeply sorry. The company has denied its formula is linked to the illnesses. What I don't understand is why Abbott didn't immediately address these issues without having to be told to by the FDA or anybody else. Representative, we prioritize safety and compliance in our plants, and we're committed to to, to doing so and getting better coming out of this Event. Madam Chairman, for the record, I'm not satisfied with the witnesses' answers. FDA Commissioner Robert Califf detailing disturbing conditions inside the Abbott facility. Let's say you had a next-door neighbor who had uh, leaks in the roof. Um, they didn't wash their hands. They had bacteria growing all over the kitchen. You walked in and there was standing water on the counters and the floor. You probably wouldn't want your infant eating in that kitchen. The commissioner testified that Abbott has repaired the leaking roof and replaced the floor. The FDA also facing blowback for acting too slowly after receiving a whistleblower complaint last October. But the plant didn't close till months later. How does that happen? How can that possibly happen? Well, let me just point out that um, the, the complaint was received. It was logged in right away. There were some medical issues that delayed it. We're on record as saying it took too long. The outrage spilling over as a second plane carrying emergency formula landed at Dulles International Airport, carrying 114 pallets of Gerber Good Start hypoallergenic formula to be trucked to Pennsylvania, ready to hit store shelves this weekend. As South Korea joins the U.S. and Japan in responding forcefully to the regime's latest missile provocation, a senior South Korean diplomat has emphasized how the recent Yoon Biden summit in Seoul set to tone for close tri trilateral coordination and the country's evolving foreign policy. From tackling North Korea's provocations to dealing with geopolitical tensions and threats to economic security, South Korea is already expanding the scope of its cooperation to become a global pivotal state. Based on these core values, Im says South Korea is working to expand its role as a key partner in addressing a range of global issues, starting with Seoul's trilateral ties with Washington and Tokyo. The diplomat says the three countries share many common challenges to regional and economic security beyond the North Korea agenda. Regarding the pressure on South Korea to choose between its greatest security partner, the U.S., and its largest trading partner, China, Im said that Seoul's relations with these two countries are not mutually exclusive. The director general says South Korea is working on its own Indo-Pacific strategy to map out and expand the reach of Seoul's policies to promote freedom, human rights and liberal democracy. We have some good news for you. U.S. drugs giant Pfizer has said it will no longer make a profit from selling its patent medicines to 45 of the world's low-income countries. Pfizer plans to make all its patented medicines available at a not-for-profit price for the world's poorest nations. That will include treatments for infectious diseases and cancers. The announcement came Wednesday, with company chief executive Albert Bourla speaking at the Davos gathering of business and world leaders. Pfizer is excited and proud to launch an accord for a healthier world. Through this groundbreaking initiative, Pfizer will provide all its patented medicines and vaccines that are available in the U.S. or in the European Union on a non-for-profit basis to 1.2 billion people living in 45 lower-income countries. The deal will include new medicines as they come out. It was welcomed by African leaders present at the Swiss event, including Rwandan President Paul Kagame. Pfizer's commitment under the Accord program <coughs> sets a new standard in this regard, which uh, we hope to see emulated by others, combined with additional investments in strengthening Africa's uh, public health systems and pharmaceutical 
Regulators. The Pfizer deal covers 27 designated low-income countries and 18 other poorer nations. All have lacked good access to innovative treatments, which can take years to become available in developing countries. Now, Yemen is searching for new wheat suppliers but will need help to pay for increasingly costly imports as the World Food Programme warned of cuts to food aid for millions already living on the brink of famine. Grocery shoppers in Yemen are watching events far from home drive up prices. Yemen's economy has been wrecked by years of war. In some parts of the country, food price inflation has already doubled in two years. Now the war in Ukraine and a sudden wheat export ban by India could make a bad situation worse. Yemen is searching for new wheat suppliers but will need help to pay for increasingly costly imports, a government official and a main importer said. The World Food Programme feeds 13 million people a month in the country but has reduced rations for 8 million of them since January. And with a shortfall from donors, those cuts may become deeper according to country director Richard Reagan. You know, for us means that we're uh, taking food from the poor and, and feeding the hungry. So we're having to make some really tough decisions about you know, who, who gets food in an environment where, you know, really uh, everybody needs it. One of Yemen's largest food conglomerates, HSA Group, said while shipments have come into the country in recent months, there could be trouble ahead. Mohammed Hayal Saeed speaks for the group, which also supplies aid agencies. The reality is that these shipments that reached in, in March and April are shipments and contracts that have been locked months uh, before that. So that the actually shock, we will start seeing the shock in the coming months. He has called for foreign help in the form of emergency mechanisms, such as a special import finance fund and a standardized 60-day period for payment. Last week, Yemen's trade minister in Aden told that the country had enough wheat to last for three months. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. South Korean population is forecasted to drop by more than 4 million by half point of the century. With such a chronically low birth rate, the working age population is set to fall. But the number of elderly people will increase dramatically. In Afghanistan, several explosions in the capital Kabul and the north of the country killed at least 14 people. An explosion at a mosque in the capital killed at least five worshippers and injured 22. In a move to more aggressively protect the Amazon rainforest, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro is increasing fines for environmental crimes. Pakistan's ousted Prime Minister Imran Khan disbanded a protest march by supporters after clashes with police outside parliament the previous evening. But he warned that they would return unless an election was called within six days. An aeroplane dedicated to Argentine great Diego Maradona was unveiled ahead of a journey that will end at the World Cup in Qatar later this year. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with how big shoes, colorful faces and wigs bring smiles on the streets of Lima as Peru celebrates Clown Day. Stay safe and have a good night.